Good morning, everybody. Uh, this is Jeanette, and a welcome to our session two on the uh, basic report designer RD, RD that comes with the Sage 300 CRE software. For those of you that joined us for session one, this is a continuation um, of the options and features available in the report designer module. Uh, for those of you that weren't with us last time, uh, this will be a refresher course on some of the, um, again, options and features that you might not be aware of. <clears throat> um, now, before we uh, ju actually jump into the class, there were two handouts that were uh, sent along with the invitation to the session. There's a, the, a copy of the PowerPoint that we're going to be looking at. There's also a Word document um, that has the, the instructions of the things that we're going to take a look at um, that you hopefully have printed out that you can take notes on as we go through this go through the session. So again, welcome to our basic report designer class, uh, session two. Now the agenda that we're going to follow today, we're going to do a slight review of the data structure within Sage. Um, I'm I'm kind of going back over a, just a few of the things that we talked about in session one, just because it is so important that you understand how your data um, is structured and where to find the information and what kind of information is available to you uh, for the report writer. Once we do that, uh, we're going to talk some about formulas. I'm going to demonstrate the setup of a, of a basic formula, and then we'll come back out to the PowerPoint and we're going to be talking about functions, some of the common functions that will be part of your formula setup. Um, once we get through the functions, we'll come back and into the software and take a look at some design options, uh, how to set up prompts within uh, the report design um, so that the uh, person running the report, they may or may need to answer some questions to get the correct information that they need. Uh, we'll talk about how to set up conditional print areas where instead of, of setting up an overall condition on the report, you're putting a condition in a specific column for a specific value to print. We'll talk about suppressed areas as well. Uh, there may be cases where you're eliminating information from a report, and when you run the report, it's leaving blank spaces where that information might have printed. I'm going to show you how to, to uh, keep that information, uh, or those blank spaces, excuse me, from, from showing up on the report. And lastly, we're going to take a look at some report maintenance, uh, naming your report designs, uh, where to save them, how to add them to your report menu, uh, potentially adding notes uh, to your design, and even adding security uh, as far as accessing that design through Report Designer. All right, so that's a little bit about what we're going to cover today. So we're going to jump right in to the data structure within SAGE, um, and if you take a look at the uh, Word document starting on page one, we talk about how SAGE uses something called a data dictionary. Uh, try to think of this kind of like a phone book. Um, it's got names and addresses in it, basically, uh, for where you will find um, the information for your report. Now, we talked last time about the different files in SAGE. So we're, you know that we're talking about master files and transaction files for the most part. Within those, those files, though, there, there's the potential for multiple records. So it, it, it helps to understand what's in these data dictionaries when you're trying to find the correct record uh, to pull that information out. Now, some of the things that you're going to see um, in the, the printout of that data dictionary for a specific record, you'll see the, the, uh, the field name, the type of field, whether it is alpha, numeric, or a date field, um, how wide the potential field length um, for that field, whether or not you can use ODBC to replace values, or in some cases you can even create files um, with, with ODBC. If that field has hard-coded programmed special values, those will also show up on the data dictionary. And then lastly, 
you'll see the standard orders for that particular record. Uh, sometimes we call it a, a standard order, sometimes we call it a key. Um, it's, it's basically kind of the address of how the software is going to find the information that you're pulling onto the report. So again, that key, it's, it's a, it, it can be a single field or it can be a combination of fields um, as to how the software gets to that record. Additionally, the, the, we're, we're calling this the sort order for the report. So whichever record is driving the report, it's going to use the, um, the key to that record as the sort order. Um, it also controls your print, uh, your print controls. It controls conditions in, in, in some cases. So there's a little bit more to that key or that standard order other than just the location of the record. So I'm going to jump into the software for a second here and show you again where you can find, um, uh, access to these data dictionaries. Now what I've done here is I've pulled up uh, the, 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 the screen for this. This is under Tools and it's Available Fields. When you go to Tools, Available Fields, it brings up this window where it wants to know what record you want to look at. Um, I've gone ahead and selected the AP Invoice, which is the sample that's in your handout in the middle of page one. When you highlight the field, you'll see that the record is selected over on the right-hand side of the screen. If you click OK to that, you'll get the print selection window. It wants to know if you want to include ODBC uh, reporting information. So if you check that box, then when you take a look at it, it'll show you up here whether it's ODBC creatable. It'll also show you the internal field name. This is for, again, for ODBC. And it also will have an X in the column next to the field if that field is ODBC replaceable. In addition to that, you'll see the standard um, information like the field name, the field type, the length, and then again, if there's any special values that are um, hard-coded into the software, they'll be here on the, on the uh, far right-hand side. Now, at the end of this layout uh, data dictionary are the standard orders. Every record will have at least one standard order. If they have multiple standard orders, the one that's listed first is the default. So this particular record, this invoice record, is um, uh, keyed by vendor invoice. You have the option to change that order when you go in to design the report. You can select any of these uh, secondary or alternate keys to that record. So it, it just depends on what it is that you're trying to report on as to which one of these you'll select. Uh, whether you just go with the default or you pick one of the other alternate keys or you may need to set up a custom sort. So maybe what you're looking for is not listed here, so you're going to design your own sort order for this particular report. There, let's go back to our PowerPoint. <clears throat> which is uh, what's described here. So primary key or the first one listed and then alternate keys. Now let's talk a second about record relationships again. If you are looking at uh, applications that have multiple types of records for the data stored within those different files, so as an example here, we've got an accounts payable. We have multiple invoices that can, go, can be attached to a single vendor. And then vice versa. We can have a, a what's called a one-to-one -one relationship where you have a, a, an invoice that is associated with a vendor. So in, in, um, in that case, it's, it's considered a one-to-one -one relationship 
whereas the other way, a vendor can have multiple invoices, so that's considered a one-to-many. Um, it's the same sort of concept with the distribution uh, records on an AP invoice. You can have an AP invoice that has one distribution record or one you know, way of coding, one GL account number or one job, or you can have an invoice that has multiple jobs and multiple uh, GL accounts. So this relationship is something that you need to um, to kind of uh, think about as you're designing your report, especially the one that says none, where there is no relationship between some of the records that you are pulling into the design. And that may come up you know, more often than you think. Uh, one of the functions that we're going to look at uh, helps you build a relationship between these records if there is not one to begin with. So the relationships that you're going to deal with, again, for the majority of the time are, <clears throat> excuse me, one-to-one, one-to-many, or none. And again, if there is not a relationship, we do have the capability in the software to build that relationship with a formula using a function within that formula. Which brings us to the types of formulas that we're going to be talking about today. Public formulas, the first one, these are user-defined uh, formulas. They're, they are formulas that are created uh, by you, and they're stored in a single file called user.frm. Uh, the formulas can be named, they can be uh, combinations of uh, straight math or some of the functions, um, and they can, they can have multiple functions in them at the same time. So they, they, can, they can be quite simple or they can be fairly complex. That's different than an application formula. An application formula is something that Sage provides to you with the software. So it's, they're pulled in when you do the install. Uh, they can be used in reports or anywhere within the software that, that has the option to use a formula. So uh, maybe in payroll could be used on an employee or, <clears throat> excuse me, in, a, in some type of a setup for a pay or a deduction or a fringe. They cannot be created or changed. That's important to know. So they're, they're hard-coded by Sage installed with the software. You can use them anywhere. It, it, it can ask for a formula. But if you need to modify it, you have to copy it to a public formula, <clears throat> and then you can change it. And then you would use that public formula in place of the application formula. Design formulas are formulas written specific to a report design. They're, they're created within the design, saved with the, with, the designed, with the design, but they can be copied to public. So if you have a design in a report that you need to use in a different report or somewhere else in the software, you have the option when you're in that report design to copy that formula out to public. And then from there, it's, it's available to all reports and all uh, setup areas within the software. The last uh, type of formula is called a quick formula. Uh, this is something that is stored in the design in a specific column in that design. Uh, it doesn't have a name and it can't be copied. So these are ones that that I probably would say of all of them you're, you will use the, le the least if at all. I'll show you how it's done, but uh, I think design formulas probably are the better option because you have more control. Um, you can use it in other places um, and you can expand on it. So uh, again, quick formulas, they're right in the column of that report design. Okay. The components of a formula. Um, when you are setting a formula up, most of the time you'll be pulling a field from the field list. Now the fields themselves, you can't just type in a field name. You have to select them from the field list 
within the report design. So by you know, double click on them. And actually as a tip, um, you can tell the difference between a field um, and something that you have manually typed in by the color. Um, a field in a formula will be blue, while the, what you type in will be black. Um, the operators, the formula operators. So you're, you're setting up this formula maybe to do some type of math or do, or do some type of comparison. Um, these are going to be things like equal to, not equal to, greater than, less than, um, not equal. Um, and I've got a slide coming up here after a bit that, that shows what those um, operators can be. Um, and again, you're using this in some type of a comparison. Now, these have to be typed. Um, you can put spaces, um, like I've, I've said here on the slide, before or after the operator, but they're not required. However, I have gotten myself into a habit of, of putting spaces between parts of the formula just so that it's easier to read <clears throat> excuse me, as I'm building that formula. Any text that you want to put into the formula has to have quotes around it. Uh, whether it is a comparison, whether you're comparing to a value, or this is a formula that's going, that's going to actually print text within the design when, when you actually run the report. So um, again, comparisons or text to be printed have to have quotes around that particular value. And this is something, again, that you're typing in. Numbers. <clears throat> no commas or symbols. You can use uh, decimals uh, for dollars and cents. Um, functions, we're going to talk about functions um, that you can enter into a formula. We're going to actually uh, cover uh, some of the more common ones. And then order of precedence. This has to do with the math. If you've got a formula that's doing any math, it's going to, to um, do the calculation left to right. Uh, important to know that um, if you have got parentheses in your formula, it's going to do that calculation first, then multiplication and division, then addition and subtraction. So if you've got a formula that, that you've created that does do math and the result that you're getting is not correct, then this is what you need to look at. Um, it could be that your, um, your math is not correct, or the way you've got the, the, way you've got the formula uh, built is not in the correct order for it to, to calculate properly. All right, I'm going to jump into the software now. I'm going to come back to RD. Um, and this is our report that we started to build in uh, class section, uh, session one. We had a column left to build in this report for, the, for balance. And we're going to, instead of using um, an application formula for this, we're going to actually build a design formula for this, So just so I can demonstrate how to do that. So we're going to come up here under Tools and go down to Formulas. So this is formulas within the design. This is a, um, not a public formula. It's, it's a design formula. So you'll get the, if this is new, you'll get these, uh, the, uh, it'll prompt you here that says no formulas found. If we had existing formulas in this design already, they would show up as a list here, and you could actually open um, any of them up and change them if you need to. So since this is a new formula, I'm going to click on New, and it gives us the, the entry screen. So there's a couple things you need to know about here, a couple of parts. This large area here, this is where you are building the formula itself. So everything that you pull in or type is going to show up here. You'll see a field list on the, on the right-hand side. This is going to show you the primary or driving record of the of the design. So the 
it'll always pull that up first. If you are needing to pull information from a different record in the design, use the index button, and that'll show you the fields or the records that you have available to you <clears throat> to pull into this design. So we've only got two records in this design right now, the invoice record and the vendor. What I need for my formula is actually coming from the AP invoice record, so I'll just leave that um, as our record uh, display here. Now, down at the bottom, again, this index button will let you switch records. The find button will let you type in a value uh, to, of, of a field or the name of a field, excuse me, that it will jump to. Now, this is in order by kind of how, the, how you're, you do your data entry. Um, if you're having a hard time finding the field, you know the field name, you can actually click on order here and you can change the order to alphabetical order. So it's alphabetized by field name. Okay. So for our formula for the balance, we want to get the amount of that invoice minus the amount paid to come up with a balance. So I'm gonna make sure that my cursor is over here in the um, large area here, and I'm gonna double click on this amount field to bring it into the design. Notice that it's that it's blue. And then, like I said before, I've, I've kind of gotten into a habit of putting a space between my values. So I'm gonna hit the space bar and then I'm going to type a minus sign. And then I'm gonna pull in amount paid. So it's gonna do this math for me using this formula. And when I click OK, it's going to ask me for the name of this formula. So I'll give it a name. And when I click OK, it brings me back to the formula screen. And now you can see that I have a, a formula here called balance. I can close this. And then now if I index over to the design formulas, there's my balance formula. And I can actually add this put my cursor where, again, where I want that field to reside and double click on the formula name. And it brings it in. Okay. Now, this is different than a quick formula. So if I wanted to, I could do the same thing, just put my cursor where I want this field to reside, and then I can come up to Tools and go to Quick Formulas it brings up the formula entry screen for me again. And I can do the exact same formula. But notice when I say OK here, it doesn't ask me for a name. It put that formula directly into the design in that column. So I'm not able to use this formula anywhere else in the, in the design. It, it's right here. But this formula, because it's a design formula, Excuse me. I can use this anywhere else in the in the design that I want. Now I can change this formula, and maybe I should have done a different instead of amount. Maybe, oops, let me cancel that. Let me go back up here and pull that back up. And maybe I should have done it as retainage. I didn't really mean this, so I can backspace this out and I can do retainage held minus retainage paid. And, and that's replaced that formula number one. Now, as you build quick formulas, it will number them starting with one. The next one over would be two if, two if I put a second one into the, into the design. Now, if you're looking for application formulas, to pull into a design. If you click the index button again at the bottom of the field list, you can go to the, the record called AP-formulas, or whatever your application you're in, the two character abbreviation dash formulas. And that will bring up the list of application formulas that can be used in this design based on the um, driving record. 
So here, I, there is a balance field already. I could have pulled that in instead of doing a, a custom report. Um, there's not a retention one that I could have used for, the, for this quick formula. But just be aware that, that there are some pre-built pre formulas here. So if, um, if you're looking for something that might be complex, you could look at the AP formulas to see if there's something already built. And that, that could help you um, with your design. So again, getting into formulas, tools, formulas. Okay. Now something else I want to point out here, you've got some buttons here on the side that you can, uh, that you can take advantage of. We've talked about close and new. Change, if you, you, all you have to do is highlight the formula, click the change button and it brings it up and you can make modifications. Copy, if you need several formulas that are basically the same with maybe a minor change or two, instead of rebuilding them, each one from, from scratch, use the copy button and copy it to a different name. Now when you do the copy, you have the option to copy it with still within the same design, or you can copy it out to a public formula, and then that formula would be available to everyone on the system. And then after you make the copy, just go in with change and make the change. So that, that, can, that can help you. Um, Again, when you're building really complex formulas and they're, you know, they may be almost identical except one or maybe one ID or one amount that you're comparing to, the copy feature can, can really be a big help. Um, if you want to delete a formula out of the design, just use delete. All right, let's jump back into the PowerPoint and let's talk about rules. So the formula itself always follows a set of rules um, and we call those rules a syntax, meaning how, how, it's, how it's evaluated and processed. Um, functions also follow a set of rules. Um, the functions have you know, specific names. So these are not things that you're going to uh, create yourself. They are, these are common uh, formula functions uh, that uh, Sage has pulled into the report designer for you to be able to use. Um, the ones we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about ifs and joins and parts and dates. Um, so when you create your formula, you'll use that specific name um, to start a function within that formula. Okay, so the function always begins with the function name. So whatever function it is that you're trying to do. The parameters of that um, and I've got a typo in here. Okay, so the parameters are uh, in parentheses. So, <clears throat> and I've got quotes. So, um, there needs, you need to draw a parenthesis in front of vendor, and then after name. So, when you start the, when you start the function, you give, you give it the function name, and then you start with an opening parenthesis. And then you build your, your, um, your function, and then you close it with a parenthesis. Now, any alphanumeric has to be in, inside, again, this is just like the, the formula rule, you need quotes around uh, those alphanumeric um, values. And then each piece of this function needs to be separated by a comma. So notice up here in this little example where we've got a vendor, and then I have a comma here, 
and then I've got quotes, and then a comma. So it, I'm, I'm separating the parts of the function by a comma, except the very last piece, like I've said here at the bottom, you need a, you need a parenthesis there. Okay. So this will make a little bit more sense, um, those, those particular um, syntaxes will make sense as we go through these common functions. So the first one um, is the if statement. And it's really, um, it's a comparison function. You're saying, if this value is true, then give me this. If it's not true, give me this. So it's if, then, else. So like I have here in the, in the syntax, if, and then I've typed out the word if, I've got an opening parenthesis, and then I've got some type of a condition in here, followed by a comma, followed by what I want it to, to return if it's true, followed by a comma, what do I want if it's not true, and then followed by a closing parenthesis. So the example I've given here is, is uh, a payroll example. I've said if the pay type, and I'm doing this, and I would be doing this on um, like a time record, if the pay type is regular, and again, I've got that inside quotes, then give me units. Now, if I don't want anything to return, if it's false, I can leave that part of the, of the uh, uh, function off. So in this case, if when I run this, if the pay type is overtime or it's other, I will get nothing. The only time I'll get units is if the pay type is regular. Now you can have embedded if statements in a formula. So you can say if a pay type is equal to regular or a pay type is equal to overtime, give me units. So you can embed up to 19 ifs in a formula. Then if you have more than that, which this would be very complex, <laughs> if you have more than 19, then you have to link formulas together to continue, um, to continue with the if statement. Okay, so this is a very, very common uh, comparative type of function. Now, here's the list of operators. Um, that I was talking about earlier, you can actually type in GT for greater than or LT for less than or EQ or GE or LE <clears throat> or NE, or you can use the symbols that I have listed here. And actually, if you type the letters in and save it, when you go back and look at the formula, the system will actually replace your letters here with the actual symbols. So this would be um, something that you should keep handy as far as uh, building your, your formulas. All right, join. This is kind of a common one too, and I'm gonna demonstrate this when we get back in the software. Um, you can join or connect uh, fields or text together. So in this example, the syntax here is join and then an open parenthesis, value one, comma, value two, and you can just keep going. You can have a string of values that you want to connect into one, um, one line or one field on the report. So in this example, on the total line, <clears throat> I want to connect the vendor ID with the word total. So I've said join, open parenthesis, this would be the vendor ID, comma, and then I've got a quote. And there's actually a space in here. And then I've typed in the word total, and then a closing parenthesis, because this is text I've typed in, and then a closing parenthesis. Now one thing to note on this screen, spaces, it, the system does not put automatic spaces between these values. If I were not, if I did not put a space inside this quote, it would run the vendor ID and the word total together. 
Um, I'm going to demonstrate, um, there's another uh, example in your book, or in your handout on page 7, about getting city, state, and zip together. You can't just join city, comma, state, comma, zip, otherwise it would be all strung together. You've got to put quotes around if you want a comma to print after the city, and then uh, we need to do a we might need to do a space in there as well, and then the state, and then get a space, and then zip. So it's um, it can be kind of complicated if you've got multiple things that you're pulling together to see where you need to put uh, those spaces. Sometimes you might have to put a space in just a single space inside a quote all by itself. So join brings things together. Part lets you pull portions of a field out. So uh, here you might have you might have uh, maybe you didn't section your job number. So this is the this is the example I'll give here. So the syntax here is the word part, and again opening parenthesis, the field or the value that you want to separate, then a comma the starting position of where to start within that field, and then a comma, and then how long, how many, how many characters or digits to pull off of that, um, off that field, and then a closing parenthesis. So in this example, we may have had our <clears throat> a year or a department or something as the first two uh, positions in our job number, and it's all together. We didn't section the job number, when we initially set the software up. But we need to be able to pull out and maybe run a condition on those first two characters. So we need to do a part on that field job starting in position one for two. Maybe we've got a two-digit year or a two-digit location. And that's, it's important that you know how the system is going to is going to um, treat the, these fields, whether they're alphanumeric or not. So alphanumeric starts left to right. So on the job number, that's considered alphanumeric. So it would start in position one and go for two. If you're looking at dates or even numeric val some type of numeric value, it goes the other direction. So you need to you need to know how wide that field is to de determine where to start um, the, the actual count. So it's almost like it's backwards. So if you were looking maybe for the year on a date, you would start in maybe in position five and go for two or four um, to get the year off of that off that date field. Look up. This is also a very, a very common um, formula, and it's probably the most misunderstood formula that a uh, function that's out there. Um, most people struggle with this one the most. Um, this is what you would use if you are trying to build a rela relationship. Remember, I said there was a, a non relationship out there. Um, this is what you can use to try to, to uh, build that relationship. It's also used to uh, find um, information that maybe has multiple values. So that's the example that I'm giving you here with this lookup. Um, and actually, the best way that I can explain this is when you do the lookup, you give it the field that you're trying to, to, uh, to, to pull. So this field is going to come from a different record other than the driving record of the report. So you're looking up this value followed by the path to get there, meaning how am I going to get to that field? And what this is, that path, is the standard key to the, the record that is the driving record of the design. So let's say 
that I want to find the pay rate on, on an employee. Um, the, the, pay, the different types of pays that you can set up, regular, overtime, other, reimbursement, um, accrual, they all have a different pay type a number associated with them. So in this particular example, I need to pull off the employee pay record their regular, the amount that, that is associated with their regular, and that amount would be their rate. So I've said, look up, opening parenthesis, the amount off the employee pay record. So this is the field that's going to give me the rate, followed by a comma, by the employee, which is which is this is would uh, could be the employee ID off of the employee record or the employee pay record, followed by a comma, followed by a one. This one represents regular pay IDs, followed by a comma, followed by REG, which is the pay ID, inside quotes, with a closing parenthesis. So if I put this, this particular lookup into a report design in a column, I will get the employee's regular rate. So I might be, be running a, an employee list. I've got their number, their name, their, their, uh, maybe their SS number, and I want to see what their regular pay rate is. Um, this is how I would get it. I'm looking up the rate off the employee pay record and I've told it to get there by using the employee ID followed by the one that represents the pay type followed by the pay ID itself. So again, this, this function, it, it's used quite often because in, in a lot of cases, you're going to be pulling in records, multiple records into a design. Not all of those records are linked together. They, they're, they, don't they, they may not have a, a relationship. And so, and you'll actually be prompted when you're building the report, if you try to pull a field into the design where there is no relationship, the system will actually say to you, you need to use a lookup function to get there. So you are looking for a value here, and this is the path to get there. Now, and again, this path needs to come from the driving record of the report. A sum, where you're summing up um, values. You might want to sum up uh, by vendor amounts off the open uh, that are open invoices. So the syntax here is ASUM, open parenthesis, the break field, comma, and then the, the field that you're adding up. So the, I've used the example here, this ASUM by vendor ID, comma, amount. This, this would be the, it could be the invoice amount. So instead of giving, giving indivi getting individual uh, invoices on this report, I just want a lump sum total. And so that's what ASUM will give you. All right, day. Um, you might want to either pull in the day out of a date onto the report, or maybe you're using it for some type of a condition. Um, so you'll create a formula, and all that's in it is the word day, and then inside the parentheses is the date field, which is the same thing for the month. You're trying to pull the month out of um, a date field. So month parenthesis, date field, parenthesis. Same with the year. Could be that you are, maybe you're wanting to pull out, one, one of the uh, 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 example could be you, you just want month and year on a report. You can use the month and the year fields and then do a join and join those two formulas together with a slash in between. But remember, the slash has to be inside quotes. New date is another common one. 
um, that uh, is used for maybe for vacation accruals or for 401k um, uh, eligibility. So what you're doing here is you're saying take a date field and then add to it. So in this example, I've typed in new date and then an opening parenthesis and then a higher date, the higher date, this is payroll, comma, 12, comma, 0, comma, 0. I'm saying add 12 months to their higher date. And then I can say I can run a report that shows me who is eligible by by saying that um, either the period end date on the payroll or the system date um, is greater than or uh, or equal to this new date uh, formula that I've created. Uh, the, I've see that I see this new date used a lot in um, uh, vacation or PTO. Um, calculations um, and 401k ones too and even matches 401k matches where um, you need to determine if someone has been with the company long enough um, you need to, to keep in mind that this is looking for months days and years so whichever ones you're not replacing just put a zero I could have done this the other way I could have if it, if it was calendar year and not their, their higher date, I could have moved this around and said 001. So, <clears throat> you know, it just depends on, on what the criteria is uh, to build this, this new date that you're going to compare against other dates within the system. Right, so those are the um, the common functions that you might build into um, a design. There are other functions out there. <clears throat> These were just the most uh, common ones that I've seen used um, in reports, the ones I use most commonly when I'm helping people with designs. All right, so we're going to talk now about um, some options, <clears throat> excuse me, some extra options that we have inside um, and we're going to start with prompts. So if you have a design that you're having to constantly go in and change the conditions on or add a condition to every time you run the report. What you might want to look into is maybe putting that, whatever that condition is, into the design as a prompt instead, so that when you start the report, it comes up and asks you to uh, enter something that's going to be used as part of a condition on that report. It's actually done in three parts. We're going to go in here, we're going to add a prompt to the design, and then you create a formula that's going to compare that value to something else. Um, and then we're going to add that formula to the conditions of the report in uh, the overall condition area. So let's go ahead and jump in here. Okay. So uh, the Prompts are located under Design Prompt Window. Now, the majority of the time, it's going to be a re going to be required. If you if you want to set it as optional, meaning you, you don't need those uh, prompt values all the time, only maybe some of the time, you can set the uh, prompt up as optional. And then when you run the report, you will click on there will be an optional button at the bottom of the screen, and, and unless you click on that, you won't see the prompt uh, fields. We're going to go with required. So you click on this, and this gives you a little window for you to start to build 
your prompts. And you can have more than one. It doesn't have to be uh, just, just one. It can be multiple. So what you do here is you click your cursor in about in the area that you want this, this field to show up. Remember to leave enough room for the description of that field. Now what comes up here, came up here at the bottom, you'll see a little window that says create field. You click on that and it gives you the prompt field contents. And this is where you put in the description of what you want this field to, to say. Now, under the type, um, we're going to do a date. We're going to set this up so that it, it does a date range for us. Um, but you can have this be text. Uh, so the screen changes a little bit depending on, on what, what you select. If you do text, it wants to know how, how wide, how many characters, is it a required entry or not, uh, caps. Is, it an, uh, uh, is this a name field? Um, you can also uh, pull in a constant. So it pre-fills that field every time you pull it up. And then we're going to use, we're going to leave the check mark here to use the description as the field prompt. So whatever you type in here is what's going to show up back here on the prompt window. And we're going to do it as a date. We're going to say this is required. Um, so we have to put a date in when we start this report. And we're going to put, leave our uh, format as month, day, year. We're not going to have any initial value. And we are not going to put in, if we check this, it will pre-fill it with a report date. So we'll go ahead and click OK, and it brings it in. And then we're going to go, because we want to do this as a range, I'm going to start another uh, prompt. I'm going to come over here. I want to give us enough room, and I'm going to say, again, create the field, and I'm going to say ending date, and again, this is a date field. We'll say it's required, okay, and that pulls it in. Now, it's not lined up real well here, so there are you, there's some cosmetic things that you can do. I can click on this. Notice that it, it blocks it out, and I've got arrows. I can move this over a little bit. Maybe I want to pull this over a little bit because it, it just doesn't look quite right. That looks a little bit better. And maybe I want to have some descriptive stuff in here too. Um, so I'm going to pull this down. I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And then I'm going to, again, click in here. I'm going to drag this down a bit. Some room here. Pull this down again. And then I'm going to go ahead and click up in here again. And then down here in this little window, where instead of creating a field, I'm going to tell it to create text. And I'm going to say, enter, uh, what's in your documentation. Um, so you'll you'll put the text in, you'll tell it um, what style to use, and then what color. We'll make ours red. And then again, because it pops in there not quite where I want it, I'm going to go ahead and drag it over so it looks a little bit better. See how that looks? Looks a little bit better. Okay. Okay. So now we've got our prompt. This is step one. We've got the prompt that we want. Uh, and again, you can add multiple uh, prompts in here. doesn't have to be this specific one. You, maybe you're looking for a specific job or a job range or a specific department uh, or a specific company ID. It uh, just depends on what it is that you're always having to enter every time you run this report. All right, so I'm going to OK this. Now, step two is to create a formula for this prompt, for this, for this to, to be an actual condition <clears throat> um, that we can use uh, 
to only get selected invoices on this report. So under formulas, I'm going to say new, and I'm going to say that the I want I, I only want invoices that have an invoice date. Let me find it here, and there it is. That is greater than or equal to. I'm going to index back over to my prompt fields. I now have a an option here for prompt fields. greater than or equal to the starting invoice date that I've entered when I run this report and I'm going to I'm going to connect two together I'm going to come back to the invoice that invoice date is less than or equal to and I'm going to index back over to my prompt fields the ending date <clears throat> So the invoice date has to fall within that range, greater than or equal to the starting date and less than or equal to the ending date. And I'm going to OK that, and I'm going to call this date. And just, I would come up with a naming scheme for yourself. I owe anything that I consider to be a condition uh, type formula, I put capital C and D on the end of it so that I know when I'm looking at the, the list of, of designs, I know which ones are actually conditions that I can use. Okay. So I'm, I've done step two now. I've got my condition. Step three is to actually assign that formula as a condition. Now I've got two conditions in here already. Um, I'm only printing open invoices, and I only want subcontractor invoices to print to uh, to show up. I'm going to add a, a third one, and I'm going to say and I'm going to index here to my design formulas that that date condition is equal to the check mark means true. So. The invoice date has to fall within this within this um, date condition formula. And I'll OK that. And then let's go ahead. I'm going to get rid of, well, nope, let's pretty this up just a little bit more. I'm going to go ahead and extend out here my lines. And I'm going to go ahead and get a, a column heading here. And this line, and actually, I'm going to make these. Oops, not pluses. Equal signs here. Let's make that look a little nice. And then I'm going to go ahead and remember what we said in session one. Use keep using that save button. All right. Now I've got a prompt here. So I'm going to say, show me everything uh, January through July. Okay. So I can see here um, that's all I'm getting. It's just the, year, the sample data is back in 2015. So this is all I'm getting are, are these dates. Let's say, well, you know what? I only want to see May. So I'm going to go ahead and, and do it that way. Now I only see my May invoices. Okay. Right, so that's how you can work with, with a prompt. So instead of me having to go in and build a condition every time I run this report to see a specific month, I've got a date range here that I can use instead. A lot easier than trying to come in and, and do that condition every time I run the report. 
Okay. So prompt fields, they can be a huge, huge um, asset to your report. All right, let's talk about suppressing blank lines. So if you've got an area on the report that may or may not have values print, but it's leaving a blank space, you may want to use the suppress option in order to help with that. So we're going to change up our design here just a little bit so I can show you what I mean. I'm going to come over here to the uh, <clears throat> vendor. And I've only pulled in address line one on my design here, but I may have I may have some people here that have a second line of address. So I'm going to go ahead and pull in address line two. And it, I need to tell it to only print once per. So it's the same color. All right, so let's save that. Let's go ahead and run our report again. And look at what happens here. I've got quite a few people here that do not have a second line of address, but there's this blank space here after address line one. So it's not pulling the, the information together for me like I would like. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to change my view here to suppressed areas. Right now I'm looking at print controls, so it's telling me how often things are going to print on the design. I want to see suppressed areas. And you'll see that when the screen comes up, there's, there are no suppressed areas. Uh, so it, it's going to try to print everything. I'm going to suppress this field right here. So I'm going to block this out. And I'm going to come down to the bottom where it says Suppress Options option. And I'm going to click on that, on that kind of that bar at the bottom. And I'm going to say Suppress any blank rows. And when I do, notice the color change. It's now yellow. So I'm going to save that. <clears throat> I'm going to run the report again. And now it's pulled it up. So anybody that does not have a second line of address it, uh, it, it eliminates that blank space. Okay. Now one other thing I'm noticing here, notice that my city-state zip is pretty spread out. I'm going to demonstrate to you here really quickly how we can get those things together. So I'm going to do a Tools, again, Formulas, New, and I'm going to index over to the vendor record. And I'm going to join City. And then I need a, a actually a comma. So this comma right here, after the word city does not print. The only comma that's going to print is this one here that's inside the quote. And then I'm going to put a space after that comma because I want a space after the comma, and then I want state. So these, what's confusing here to understand is the commas and the spaces that are outside of the quote will not print. Okay, so now I can do another quote, and I'm going to do two spaces and then the zip. Pull that together. So I want to get city, comma, space, state, and then two spaces and then the zip code. And we'll call this city, state, zip. All right. And then I'm going to come back. I'm going to change my view back to print controls here. And I'm going to 
delete these three fields. So I block them out, hit delete, and then I'm going to pull in, I'm going to index over here to my <clears throat> design formulas, and I'm going to pull city state zip. And let's save that, and let's print again. That's much better. So I've got the city, state, zip um, all pulled together. And notice the spacing. I've got my comma printing, I've got a space, and then I've got two spaces after the state for the zip code. That looks much, much better on my report. All right, let's talk now about conditional print. So let's say that you have columns set up for values maybe that are based on maybe a date range, maybe this, I know they use this for the, um, the aging reports that SAGE sends out. Instead of assigning a condition to the overall report, you want to set a condition on a specific uh, column in a report. Let's go back. All right, so we're going to change our view again down here to conditional print areas. So right here you're, we're seeing um, that there are none. This, is, it, this navy blue means that there are no con, uh, conditional print areas here. So let's see what kind of an example we can use here. Um, We could change our report design. Let's go ahead and take out, or let's see, let's go ahead here. Actually, let's add here. We're going to add the amount column again two more times. So amount. Amount. And this amount is going to be under 30. We'll use the same example in your handout. And this amount is going to be over 30. All right. So we're going to come now in here under formulas and we're going to create some new formulas here. Hmm. I'm just going to try using the prompt field instead. Use the ending date and then index back over here to the invoice and grab the invoice date. Than 30. Say okay to that. We're going to call this um, over 30. And then we're going to use show you the, how to copy here, and we'll say under 30. We're going to change this. Less than. Oops. Oop. Here we go. I had it wrong. I forgot all that. Okay. So I've got my two formulas for my two new um, amount columns. 
And now I'm on the conditional print area, and I'm going to click into that field. And down here again at the bottom, you have this bar that says Print When True. If I click in that bar, you'll see that I've got some design formulas here, and I've got my under 30. And I'm going to say Suppress Blank Lines if False. I can say yes there um, so that I don't have to, to set up a suppression area. This it, It's kind of combined into one, uh, one function. Now notice the color change. This, this field is now uh, black because it has a conditional uh, print assigned to it. Now for the over 30, I'll do the same thing. I'll come down here where it says print when true, and I'll say over 30 and suppress the blank lines if false. OK, that. Notice it's a different color. So I can have multiple um, conditional print areas, and the color corresponds to the formula that, that I'm using. If I use the same formula on both of these, they would both be the same color. But this, has a, this first uh, under 30 has a different formula assigned to it than the over 30. That's why it's a different color. So you could have multiple conditional print areas on the same report. They could all be using the same formula. They would all be the same color. Or you could have multiple conditional prints using different formulas. They'll be different colors. That's how you can tell if, if, if they're the same or not. Now, to see if one has a uh, formula on it, you just click into the field. You see at the bottom where it says print, print when true. There's nothing after it. But if I click on one of these, notice it says print when true under 30. That's the formula that it's, that it's going to be running. If I print, click on this field, I see over 30 down here in the, in the bottom left-hand corner. Now, this doesn't stop the information from printing overall on the report. It just stops it from printing um, in, these two certain, in these two columns. So let's go ahead and save, and let's try running this again. And first, I'll run it. Let's just run it this way. Preview it. Okay, so it's looking here to see what's under 30, what's over 30. So it separated the values out from the uh, from the single column here into two separate columns based on the date. So anything in, in that's in May is in under 30. Anything that's older than May is out here in the over 30. Right, so we've got um, some maintenance things to to uh, to look at, and before we do that, I've got a couple other things I want to show you in here. <clears throat> this first one, design or da uh, data file selection. You've probably noticed that every time I go to run this report, I have to select the file. So if I come here to run it making me select. And if you're always selecting the same file, that's kind of a pain. So you can lock that in on the design. Just go to data file selection and, uh, and uncheck the select when printing and select the file that you are always using. So now when I run it, it pops straight to the print, select, uh, print selection window. I no longer have to select the file. So this can be a big help if you're all, again, if you're always selecting the same, um, the same uh, file or files, you can, you can lock that in. Okay. All right, so we're going to look now, it's, uh, again, like I said, some maintenance things. We're going to set a default location for your custom reports. Um, 
by default, your, your reports are going to try to go into your uh, main data folder, and that's maybe not where you want them. Uh, we're going to look at adding new reports to the report menu. We'll look at security, notes. We've already, I just did the, the data file selection. So let's again jump back in. All right, let's start with file locations. So if we take a look at file, company settings, file locations, you'll see a list of all of your different file types. If you scroll to the bottom, reports is like third from the bottom on this list. You see what it says up here at the top, data folder, leave blank for current folder. That means that this report design that I'm doing, working on right now is going to show up or is being stored in the Timberline construction sample data folder. Um, if you want to share this, if you've got multiple data, uh, company data folders on your system, you may want to create a separate folder for this, for these reports, so that everybody can share. So what all you need to do is put your path name in here of where to, to look for this report or store it. Now, I would not put it in the um, Timberline Office uh, 9.5 Accounting Report folder. That is where all of the, um, actually, let me get in here and show you. Uh, if we go in and take a look at that, if I come in here under Program Data and under Sage and under Timberline Office, and I go to 9.5 Accounting, there is a report folder here that has all of the reports that Sage sends out. So I would not store your, your custom reports in here because when you get an, if, if something happens to your system and you have to reinstall or if you upgrade, this data, this, this report folder gets replaced and you, you have the potential here to lose all your custom reports. So please create a separate folder for these custom reports uh, to share. If you only have one data folder, leaving those, those uh, reports in the current folder is, is just fine. Right. So again, you're looking for this under File, Company Settings, File Locations. Okay. All right, Reports menu. Go in here and open up. We'll add this report to our AP into our AP section. All right. Come on. Just thinking about it. Here it comes. All right. Every application has a reports drop down. And at the top of that reports dropdown is your reports manager. So this is where you can add or delete reports off, the, off that reports dropdown. So if you are adding a new report, you just click on new, you give it the report name, and we'll call this class open invoices. So this is not the report design name that actually goes down here a little further. This is what you want to see displayed as this report name when you look at it with the reports dropdown. Then under report menu, you can use the list button and you can put this report anywhere you want into any of these sub um, menu groups or you can create your own just by, by typing in the, a name and it'll actually create that for you. Now under source, your source is your type. Uh, if this is an RD report, it's gonna be TS report design. If, this, if you're adding a crystal report, you would select crystal. Don't do anything with these special or office connector types. Those are assigned to the reports that they provide. The special is for um, our ledgers and our financial statement stuff, so you will not select that. The only two that you'll uh, worry about are these top two. 
Right. Then you're going to put your cursor in the file name field, hit the list button, and here's where you'll see, here's our report class name right here. That's our, our design. And you'll, so then you'll lock in the design name, and then you'll click OK. okay. Now to run this, I just hit the close button here. I actually may have to close this design. I think I can have it open while I'm running it over here. Now I have a new subgroup here called Custom. And there, here's my report. It brings it up, just like I saw in Report Designer. And I can run it from here. Now, the other things that you can do with Report Manager, you, again, you can change any of these that are already there. So if one of these reports, maybe uh, you change the design and it has a different design name now, you can clump, come in here with change, and you can change this, the, the, the file name that it uses. So change is, is for you to be able to come in to on any existing report on the, on the dropdown and change a description or change the report design name. If you've got a bunch of reports out there that you no longer use or you've never used and, and you just don't want to see them anymore, you can use the delete. If you want to move things around, you can use the arrange button and it allows you to move reports up and down. So maybe we don't want this to be at the very bottom. Maybe we want this uh, up a little higher. So you can use the move up. And you see how it moved it up? I can move it up, 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 up. And maybe I'll go up here. Let's see what's up here higher. Forms, lists. Let's see. Keep going. I can move this up as high as I want. Let's move it right here. And I can say OK. Close. It's doing its little synchronization thing here. And now it's up here, not down at the bottom. Okay. So you can move things around on any of these submenus and, and again, delete things out move things up and down. If you want to uh, you know, print this out first before you start making changes, um, this, that's what this print button does. It allows you to get a hard code, coded printout of what the, re what the reports are <clears throat> and where they're located. Sometimes it's easier to work with stuff on paper. Okay, let's go back into reports. I'm going to open that report design back up. Okay, um, security. So if you don't want anyone to make changes to your design through Report Designer, you can assign security to it just by going into design and, and putting a password on it. Um, design notes. This is under design, design notes at the bottom. So you might want to put your name in here. Um, so in the future, people know who designed it. And then you can put some comments in. Now the nice thing about this is that a lot of the reports that Timberline designed um, have notes in there. So if you're trying to figure out why or how 
they put this report design together, if you pull that design up with RD, you can go to the design notes and it'll actually explain it to you in the comments area. Okay, um, I think we've talked about everything under design, so I think we're, I think we're in good shape here. All right, so uh, tips and reminders. The sort order of your report, remember from our last session, it does more than just determine the order that the report is going to print by. It determines totaling. It can determine print controls. Um, so it, it's, it's more than just the order. Uh, save your designs in a separate folder. If you, if you lose your software and those reports are in the report folder, unless you have a good backup, um, you may lose your designs. The other thing to remember, um, Sage provides literally hundreds of reports in the report folder. They're not all listed on the reports dropdown uh, menu inside each application. They only listed the more common ones. So if you're looking for something for a report, and you don't see it on that reports drop-down, before you start reinventing the wheel, look in the report folder to see if, if Sage doesn't have something there that you can at least start with. Uh, the reports are in alphabetical order by um, application. Um, another tip here about troubleshooting formulas. I didn't show you that here. If you come in under Tools Formulas and you have this window open here, you can come up to the top here in the far left corner and do File, Print. And it will give you a hard copy of what your formulas look like. So sometimes when you're trying to troubleshoot your formulas, it, it's a lot easier if you have it printed out on paper. And then you can you can look at multiple formulas at the same time, and you can you know take notes on it. And a lot of times it is it's easier to read if if you do it that way. The other tip that I have for you is if you've got a formula in the software um, and it's not working. So a, a good example of this is, would be in payroll. So you've got you've got maybe got a new formula in there uh, to to do accruals maybe. Put those formulas into a report, um, especially if the formula has multiple formulas in it um, to come up with a value. Print the separate parts of those formulas in separate columns um, within a report design. Sometimes if you can see the, the pieces, um, you can figure out which part of that formula is failing. And then lastly, be sure you save your design multiple times while you're creating it. Um, there's nothing worse than having something happen and you get booted out of RD and you've been in it for a while making changes to formulas and columns and, and that, and then all of a sudden it's gone and you have to start over. I've learned that lesson um, multiple times. Um, so use that save button. Uh, multiple times while you're in that design. All right, that takes us through session two, everybody. Um, really happy that you that you joined me today to finish up the the RD sessions. Um, we have some. We actually have a little bit of time left. So if there's any questions, Tina, if anybody has typed in any questions in the chat area. Um, we can hang here for a minute or two and answer those questions before we hang up. If you don't have any questions right now, if you want to email Tina uh, your questions, she'll forward those on to me and I'll be happy to respond. So, yep. Tina? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't see any questions right now, so I guess you're doing a pretty good job. <laughs> people <aren't> <laughs> oh. <laughs> You're boring I, jumped or... I jumped around there a little bit, but I, I we, yeah. 
some of those some of those functions can be a little bit on the hairy side. <laughs> so true. So we'll give a, we'll give a, everybody a second if they yeah. if they have any questions that they want to answer with the, want answers for with the group. No, nope, not getting any yet. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody, for joining us, and I hope to see you in a in a future future session. We've got something coming up in July. Just a, just a heads up, we're going to follow this up with an inquiry designer on July 11th. Uh, so if you're interested in that, I I hope to see you then. So everybody, have a great rest of your day. And let us know if you have if you think of any questions later. Thank you.